Today's presentation is about health equity, race, and a pandemic. We're going to talk about COVID-19 and experiences of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color as a symptom of racial inequality. A little bit about myself. I am a board-certified licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor in the School of Psychology here at UOttawa, where I also serve as the Canada Research Chair for Mental Health Disparities. I'm also the clinical director of the Behavioral Wellness Clinic in Connecticut, and my research interests include cultural competence in research and healthcare, ethnic differences in psychopathology symptoms and the role of ethnic identity, PTSD and racial trauma in people of color, phenomenology assessment and treatment of OCD, microaggressions and discrimination, and psychedelic medicine in mental health. Now, an early look into the mental health of BIPOC groups during COVID-19 gives cause for worry in the short and the long term. Uh, first of all, as you can see in this first bubble, six in 10 indigenous respondents report that their mental health has worsened since the onset of physical distancing. Um, and this was um, compared to 52% of for non-Indigenous participants. And this is so important because we know that physical contact is really important for people's well-being and sense of belonging and just generally feeling calm inside. Regarding stress and anxiety, 40% of Indigenous respondents described most days as quite a bit stressful or extremely stressful, and 41% reported symptoms consistent with moderate or severe anxiety. Uh, this was in comparison to about a quarter for non-Indigenous participants. A Canadian Mental Health Association COVID-19 survey found that people of color were more likely to have trouble coping with the pandemic. And CMHA also found BIPOC were two times more likely to worry about being safe from physical or emotional domestic abuse. What causes these racial disparities? Well, the answer is short, racism. But I will give you the longer answer here. So social determinants, COVID-19 infection rates and negative outcomes are seen at higher rates in lower income population of which BIPOC are overrepresented. Um, Montreal Nord is the borough with the highest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Montreal. It is also one of the poorest districts and has an unemployment rate three to five points higher than the rest of the area. Now, working class people are the essential workers. Um, however, the virus is spread quickly through poorer boroughs, including Montreal Nord, Mercier, Hochildaga, Maisonville, and the Ahunistic Cartierville, while early outbreaks in more affluent areas have, interestingly, been better contained. Um, also, consider that one in five of Montreal's confirmed. COVID-19 cases are healthcare workers. And, um, and as I pointed out, the disease is having its most devastating toll on families in the poorest neighborhoods. Social distancing is difficult for lower income communities due to overcrowding and inability to work remotely. Consider that individuals in public facing and, and low income professions appear to have a higher risk of contracting COVID-19. Uh, this includes, but is not limited, to bus drivers, grocery clerks, receptionists, firefighters, and personal care aides. Now, in the U.S., there are 14.4 million workers in jobs where exposure to or infection with COVID-19 can occur with increased frequency. Um, and these jobs are disproportionately held by people of color. Now, the Brookfield Institute found that this situation is similar here in Canada, as these same public facing occupations are predominated by visible minorities. And these occupations pose a higher risk for exposure to viral infection and are not amenable to distancing measures. So consider that 
essential staff, such as nurse aides, orderlies, and patient service associates are more likely to belong to the BIPOC communities. That's 34% than workers in all other occupations, 21%. And again, as I pointed out, not amenable to distance, distancing measures. Now, one in five indigenous people live in housing considered unsuitable for the number of people living there. And within Inuit populations, this is expected to be even higher, creating more opportunities for transmission of the virus. And consider also that Black Canadians who commute to work are twice as likely to use public transit than the average Canadian, also yet another potential source of infection. Now, in terms of healthcare delivery, discrimination by health providers leads to avoidance of healthcare services and non-adherence to treatment in BIPOC groups. Um, in conducting interviews within five indigenous communities in Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia, researchers noted avoidance, resistance, and non-compliance behaviors from indigenous type 2 diabetes patients due to mistrust of health providers and feelings of ongoing racial discrimination. And a 2003 study of women of color um, accessing healthcare services in Toronto found one in five experienced a form of racism. So if going to the doctor means that you are going to experience race, racism, well, a lot of people just aren't going to go um, until it's really quite severe. BIPOC communities are also more likely to experience healthcare service and necessary resource accessibility barriers um, during the pandemic. In northern communities, many nursing stations, for example, are understaffed and missing COVID-19 essential uh, personal protective equipment. So that's a big problem. Um, also, another problem is that uh, it, Canadian data is pretty thin on the impacts of discrimination on help seeking and adherence within the COVID climate. Now, we know that certain types of conditions put people at higher risk um, for bad outcomes for COVID-19. So comorbidities such as hypertension, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and type 2 diabetes and obesity means there is going to be a higher risk of COVID-19 symptom severity and mortality. And these conditions um, are all linked because they contribute to oxidative stress on cells. And COVID-19 causes similar stress on the cells, leading to an exacerbation of these existing set conditions. And we know that um, people of color are more likely to have a lot of these conditions that um, make COVID-19 worse. If we look at First Nations um, people, we see that they are have higher risk due to high alcohol consumption, asthma, diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Black Canadians have high rates of diabetes and hypertension. Um, immigrants, recent immigrants, um, have high rates of hypertension and long-term immigrants also have high rates of hypertension and also higher rates of diabetes. So again, all of this comes together, meaning poorer outcomes for people of color. So how do we decolonize our practices? How do we make all of this more fair and equitable? Well, for one, we have to make sure indigenous people are getting equal, equal resources or even greater resources if we need to make up for long periods of lack. We need to ensure educational opportunities are fairly distributed geographically, share decision-making power, make sure indigenous people are included in all facets of the work, including as doctors, lawyers, politicians, administrators, and consumers. We need to track progress and outcomes, course correct if needed, and there needs to be some accountability for outcomes. Further, non-Indigenous researchers should use community-based participatory research approaches. Within the United States and Europe, Black people are suffering at higher rates than their white counterparts. And it's becoming clear that the hardest hit of all countries, our neighbors to the South, um, are the racialized groups are suffering at much higher rates. Uh, Black Americans represent about 14% of the U.S. population, but 30% of those who've contracted the virus. And in the U.K., the National um, Office for Statistics found that black people were over four times more likely to die with COVID-19 than white people. And British people of South Asian descent 
were perishing at two to three times the rate of white people. And recent reports from Norway indicate that immigrants from Somalia had infection rates over 10 times the national average. We have no reason to think that it's going to be any, that it's any different here in Canada. Um, I mean, while the Canadian BIPOC experience is not as stark, this is really mostly because we don't have enough data. Um, in Canada, again, there's a severe lack of race-based data about which groups have been impacted by COVID and in what ways. Now, some jurisdictions like the provinces of British Columbia and Ontario, as well as the city of Toronto, have pledged to collect this information so it can address health inequities. Um, the federal government has also stated they're working toward collecting race-based health data as part of their response to the pandemic. Presently, Ontario is only is one of the only provinces to have released preliminary findings, which suggests that two thirds of reported cases resided in neighborhoods with the highest diversity. With more detailed findings, the city of Toronto also released BIPOC individuals make up over half the city's population, but they represent 83% of reported COVID cases and 71% of the hospitalizations. So what little data we have, um, doesn't really look good. How are black Canadians experiencing COVID-19? Well, we have some news. There is some new research on black Canadians and COVID-19. And, um, and what this new research shows, again, this is from the um, innovative online poll conducted um, in late June. And this was conducted among a sample of over 2,000 adult Canadians, and it's a, considered a national sample with uh, 400 black Canadians. And what they found were worse health outcomes. So black Canadians are more likely to report COVID-19 symptoms either themselves or, or in someone they know. They're more likely to say they sought treatment for COVID-19, nearly three times as likely um, to report knowing someone who had died due to the virus. So that's 21%. Um, of black Canadians say they know somebody who died from the virus. And, um, and also, again, black Canadians are much more likely to report that their job requires them to work with people face to face. Um, and so again, that puts them at more risk. And they're more likely to feel that no matter what steps they take, their day to day routine puts them in an uncomfortably high risk of catching the virus. Black commuters who go into work at least part-time are much more likely than the national average to report symptoms, to seek medical treatment, and have to be admitted to the hospital or know someone who has. And their black commuters are, are more than twice as likely to say their commute is unsafe. Um, so additionally, black Canadians report much worse financial impact than um, the average Canadian and are more likely to have suffered layoffs or reduced working hours in their household and are more likely to say their household finances have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. And when it comes to age and gender, it's black men over 45 who are the most negatively impacted by COVID-19 when it comes to household finances. So what can we do to help? Right now, we really need to start collecting race-based data. And uh, I know some people have felt uncomfortable with this because fact of the matter is race as a social construct is a racist construct. And you might think, why do we want to do something racist? And the problem is because these um, negative outcomes are affecting people racially. Uh, it's because of racializations in the, in, racialization in the first place that we have these problems. And so we have to collect the data so we know who's being hit hardest and how to address it. So short and long-term race-based evidence is needed to promote equity and resource allocation and the development of new services to meet underrecognized needs as they relate to COVID-19. And this includes things like culturally informed research methods, collecting race-based data within your own research, and lobbying our local governments and institutions to collect race-based data. And you also should educate yourself and those in a position of privilege around you. So COVID-19 did not create the racial disparities we're seeing, but it did magnify them. So keep learning and do your own anti-racism work. It is easy to feel helpless in the face of all this, but if we all do a little, it can add up to be a lot. 
thank you so much uh, for listening to this presentation. And um, if you want to learn more, uh, I encourage you to check out these books, Eliminating Race-Based Mental Health Disparities, which is an edited volume I put together last year uh, that addresses a lot of these things. And then this summer, Managing Microaggressions came out. So um, that is especially for therapists and other clinicians. Also, if you have questions and answers, you can keep the conversation going by visiting my meetup group. It's called Anti-Racism International, US, Canada, and Europe. And there's the link at the bottom. And we have regular uh, meetings where we talk about these issues and ask questions and learn more. And so I would love to see you there if you can make it. Thanks so much. That is the end of our show.